The Bell Telephone System brings you another of its series of programs on science. Man's effort to understand nature's laws. The story of language is the story of man. For the thoughts, the aspirations, the affections of long generations of humanity are woven into the fabric of human speech. And that's the way it begins. The story of language all over the world. The sounds of human speech, like the very air we breathe, or something most of us take just for granted. When did you hide the paper? Now, David, you run right upstairs and walk. And don't forget to brush your teeth. You'd hardly think of our everyday speech as being a specimen for scientists to take apart piece by piece, to study, to analyze. But this is a science, the science of linguistics. There are perhaps many ways to tell this story. We've chosen to tell it through the imagination of the young lady who lives in this house. Now, as you will see, she's head over heels in linguistic problems of her own. And she might call it... use a preposition to end a sentence with. Why shouldn't participles dangle? Why does it have to be so many different words? Words, words, words! How do you do? Why does he talk that way? Because he's the Jabberwock and talks Jabberwocky. What are you two doing out of the Alice in Wonderland book? We're going to free all the people enslaved by words. We are going to do away with the alphabet. Take Vorpal Sword and Tulji to rub out the words. Words are awfully confusing. Sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to them at all. Good. You may join our conspiracy. Here, take a note. Ah, uh, Judy, 
will lead the letters into trap. Go on. Go on. <laughs> I'll take care of the capital letters. You may take care of the little ones. Hello, Judy. Who's he? He's a professor of linguistics. Linguistics? Well, Judy, what are you doing? We're going to do away with the alphabet. <laughs> to murder the language. Which one? There are at least 5,000 different languages in the world. There are a few of the dictionaries. Where would you like to start? What's he do? Speak all kinds of languages? He does to speak them. He's a scientist of language. A science of language? Oh, yeah. He studies the insides of language. Sounds and words and alphabets. And alphabets. Is he for them or against them? Well, there's some things to be said in favor of alphabets. Name one. The alphabet is the basis of writing, for one. Then let's get the man who invented the alphabet. Yes, I'd like to meet him. I'm afraid that would be a bit difficult, because people have been writing for five or 6,000 years. Why, that's centuries. Yes, Judy, it is. The people have been talking for a long time. If this ruler represents the time man has been talking, he's been writing only this long. But even today, in many areas of the earth, large numbers of people, millions of them, still get along without writing. If they get along, why should they bother to learn? Well, they can't learn to write, most of them, because they have no alphabet. No alphabet. But as civilization began to spread over the earth, People realized spoken language alone has its limitations. They were learning so much they couldn't remember it all. You might say, Judy, that's why writing was invented. Then that must be why we have whole libraries full of books. Because people wanted to write down for other people what they thought and what they did. Pity. People were talking to each other long before there was anything like civilization. Scientists don't know exactly how it all got started. Once on the move, speech grew like a great tree with branches joining at limbs, branches growing out of other branches, branches running up into twigs, each a spoken language that was the source of still other languages, and each changing as it went along and developed until 5,000 or more known languages spread through the ages. Even now, languages are continually changing. New ones springing from old ones, sometimes several from a single source. Latin was very important, wasn't it? Oh, yes, it certainly was. What we call the Romance languages all branched off from the great trunk of Latin. There's Italian, Sardinian, Spanish and Portuguese, Dalmatian and Romanian, Catalan and French Provencal, Rito Romance, and if you listen, you'll hear a certain similarity. Padre? Yes. Papa? Tata? Papa? They all do talk something alike. Well, Judy, would you be interested to know that at a certain time of their lives, babies all over the world speak the same language? Oh, just a moment. I know better than that. What about Chinese babies and Indian babies, German babies, French babies, and American babies? Well, now, just listen to the language that all those babies speak. Now, here's a typical baby. Isn't this one rather young to talk? All babies in the world have the same, well, baby language to start with. The same babbling, if you like. But this babbling includes the sounds needed to make any language. I didn't think baby talk really meant anything. Oh, baby babbling is very important. When a baby first comes into the world, the speech areas of his brain are like a clean slate, ready to be written upon. From the very moment of birth. With every sound a baby makes, he is producing, you might almost say practicing, the basic sounds of speech. Then he learns to talk just by practicing. 
not entirely. Through the first year, the child listens to his parents and copies as closely as he can what he hears, winning their approval when he makes the right sounds. Then the sounds begin to take shape. And by the age of six, the speech pattern is complete. <laughs> it's Daddy. Hello, Daddy. Babies all start with the same sounds, and then they just keep the ones that fit their language. I think I'll make a note of that. You might also make a note that we have a conspiracy to get on with. Shall we go? Oh, yes, that conspiracy to do away with the alphabet. May I ask a question? What is it? Why do you want to get rid of the alphabet? It's language we're after, really. And the letters of the alphabet are the building blocks of language. That's a beautiful statement. Thank you, Judy. Very well put, but hardly scientific. Professional jealousy. If I wanted to do away with language, what I would go after would be sounds, because sounds are the basis of any language. Sounds. Make a note of that. I suppose the next thing you're going to say is there's a science of sound. Well, as a matter of fact, there is. For a long time, scientists have been curious about how our human sounds are actually made. In the course of such a study, Professor Wolfgang von Kempelen invented the world's first talking machine. Make a note to get from Kempelen. That was in the 18th century, around 1780. Cross him off, we're too late. Here's a drawing of von Kempelen's machine when the professor completed it. I wouldn't even know how to begin to build a talking machine. What are you doing, Judy? I'm trying to imagine how the professor figured it all out. Before a talking machine could be built, the professor had to do a scientific study of just how the human speech mechanism works. Lungs, vocal cords, mouth, palate, nasal cavities. For speech, you need... Air. The chest muscles, acting as a bellows, operate to fill our internal bagpipe, the lungs, with air. Next, you need... Uh, noise. A read from a bagpipe. Uh, that will do. Now we build the machine. While our friend is busy, let's look at some recent motion pictures of the human vocal cords in action. These films were made by the Gould Foundation Voice Research Laboratory at Northwestern University. You see, human noise is produced by the vocal cords, encased in the larynx or Adam's apple. Air from the lungs is released through a space between the cords, causing them to flap apart and slap together. These vibrations set up sound waves. Now, by slowing down the action with high-speed photography, we can see that the pitch of sound is varied by tightening or relaxing the pull on the vocal cords. Tightening them raises the pitch. Relaxing them lowers it. Effective as they are, the vocal cords are only the source of noise. It's the rest of the speech mechanism that shapes the sound into meaningful words. Now, what the professor had to understand to make his machine work was precisely how the tongue, teeth, lips, and so forth operate. Ah, e, o, mm-hmm, vowels. And now, consonants. B, 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 z, mm, hmm. The breath explodes, it buzzes, it hums. The machine is finished. And now, demonstration. Why, the machine spoke French. It said, you are my friend. Von Kempel's machine was quite remarkable for 1780. 
for it was the world's first successful talking machine. Scientists today have the benefit of techniques undreamed of in von Kempelen's time. In these X-ray films of the human speech mechanism in action, you can see the tongue and lips assuming various positions to form cavities that modify the sound by resonance. Who will give a needle, a mouse, a cat, and a bird to my father? The sound of the different vowels depends on the height to which the tongue is raised in the mouth. High, mid, or low. It also depends on the position of the tongue in the front or back of the mouth. Consonants are shaped by tongue, lips, teeth. Who will give a needle, a mouse, a cat, and a bird to my father? This has been very educational, Jabba. We don't have to bother with the alphabet. All we've got to do is get rid of those vowels and consonants, and our job is done. I hate to disappoint you fellows, but what really come out of the human speech mechanism are phonemes. P-H-O-N-E-M-E-S, phonemes. The basic sounds of speech. Don't even make a note of that, Judy. He's just trying to throw us off the track. Come on, Jabba, we've got plans to make. Confusing. I guess I better ask you, what is a phoneme? Phoneme is the sound. Like A, B, C? No, they're letters of the alphabet. They're units of writing. No alphabet for any language truly represents the sounds of that language. Let me borrow your pad. Sit down and I'll show you. Now, let's take this word. Either. Now, this word has five phonemes. If I say it slowly, uh, e, v, uh, er. You can hear the five parts. But some people say either. Can you say either, either, or either? Either, either, or either. As your friend the Hatter has already said, the alphabet can be very confusing. Different pronunciations are sometimes spelled in the same way. That's why scientists had to develop more accurate symbols. Now, in phonemes, either is written this way. Uh, E, v, e, er. And either is written like this. Ah, e, v, e, er. The difference is the first little phony. Right. Now, scientists such as Ferdinand de Saussure in France discovered that out of the thousands of speech sounds a human being can make, each language has picked its own set of phonemes. English, for instance, has 45. And those little phoneme sounds must really be the building blocks of language. I better make a note of that for the Hatter. But for myself, I better just stick to the alphabet. We have a proposal. If we can prove that it's possible to communicate without words, to say nothing of phonemes, Will you give up your linguistic obsession and join our conspiracy? Well, science is always open to experimental evidence. Good. One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, shut the door. Perfectly. If we can win over science, the alphabet is as good as dead. <laughs> well, Dr. Linguistics, uh, do you concede that we have made a point? Yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, I think we can substantiate your point further. I think you'll find this very interesting, Judy. You know, many people in the world have used some people still use unspoken communication. Doctor. Oh, Doctor Linguistics. Oh, would you fellows be so good as to turn these cranks? In the interests of science. This is one of the Canary Islands, La Gomera, 
off the west coast of North Africa, a land of rugged terrain. In the sparsely populated areas, people found it difficult to communicate with one another across the deep gorges. So, long ago, the Gomeras contrived an extraordinary form of telephonic speech, whistling, which can be understood over a distance of three miles. You mean they whistle in Spanish? In a way. The consonants and vowels are represented entirely by differences in pitch. This whistling language is of great interest to linguistic scientists because it makes use of only one feature of normal speech, pitch. It does without all the variations of tone quality that Professor von Kemplin was so concerned about. Now, whereas this Canary Island whistling language is based on vowels and consonants, certain native tribes of the African jungle have a drum language based on the syllables of words. I never thought of a drum talking syllables. The drum language for the Congo broadcasts every syllable of the words of a message through the changing rhythmic patterns of drum beats. If a man were to shout, a leopard is stalking our village, he might use only three syllables of his spoken tongue. But in drum language, he would need well, at least a dozen or more drum beats to convey this urgent message. Another ingenious form of language was invented in the North American plains. Indian Sign Language. When tribes met on the trail, hunted buffalo together, or met in council, wasn't time enough to learn one another's spoken language, so they used sign language instead. But here's a Sioux storyteller using hand talk to tell the famous story of the Battle of Washita. The white soldiers told the Indians, if you camp beside the river, called the Lodgepole River, before the snow, there'd be no more fighting. And that made all the Indians very happy. Excuse me for interrupting, but I was just wondering how the Indians managed to talk with their hands in the dark. Well, they couldn't, Judy. As you can see, all of these methods are limited. The great advantage of language is its versatility, giving man limitless possibilities for expressing his ideas, his concepts of science and technology, his day-by-day -day thoughts, his feelings, his emotions, love. Don't be taken in by those scientific sophistries. Do animals have alphabets? Do they have words? And animals can, without any words at all, quote, communicate from the moment of birth. And they've gotten along for millions of years without any words at all, haven't they? Oh, yes, indeed they have. Oh, would you fellows please oblige? Now look. There's a crow. When man invades the forest, he's the first to shout, beat it. And all the other birds, animals, pass on the alarm. Not only birds and animals get along without words, but insects as well. And the most incredible of all is the dance of the honeybee. When a worker bee finds a flower full of nectar, it flies back to the hive to announce the discovery. This urgent message is communicated by performing a dance. The pattern of the dance indicates the direction of the flowers in relation to the sun. The speed of the dance tells the distance from the hive. The other bees all take notice. They touch the dancer with their antennae to discover the scent of the flowers. Then they all fly out to the source of the nectar. Animals and insects have many ingenious ways of communicating. With sounds, with smells, with motion. We find in all this communication that the animal mind operates almost automatically. It receives messages from the outside through its sense organs and reacts instinctively. Hello. Hello. Why, Jabber, that's very good. You're improving. Hello. <laughs> oh, it was the parrot. Beware the jubbub, talking bird. But parrots just imitate what people say. Yes, that's because they are not able to associate a given sound or word with a specific meaning. It's curious, though. 
that they sound like people. Some animals, such as apes, do have a larynx and the rest of our vocal apparatus. The speech mechanism of the chimpanzee is the closest to that of a human being. Will you please? Research psychologist Dr. Keith Hayes and his wife raised a chimp named Vicky. After constant training, Vicky had learned to speak only three human words by the time she was three years old. Like human babies, she babbled at first. <coughs> Later, she was rewarded when she made the right sound. Mrs. Hayes would shape Vicky's lips to help her pronounce the word mama. At the age of two and a half, she could say papa and cup. Now she has learned to use all three of her words appropriately in solicitation. Now, who am I? Papa? Papa? Can you say what this is? By the age of six, Vicky's spoken vocabulary consisted of seven words, whereas human children are using hundreds of words by the time they're only two years old. Chimpanzees, orangutans, and other mammals may have larynxes and the rest of the speech mechanism, but it takes more than that. It takes brain power. We must conclude that man is the only one of Earth's creatures with true language. Because the animals can't manage to combine their cries, calls, their signals, to form the infinite variety of meaning that we achieve when we arrange words and sounds into sentences. So, Judy, shouldn't surprise you that some people have argued that what distinguishes man from beast is grammar. I knew it, I knew it. I suspected it from the moment he started building up this so-called science of linguistics that all these pretentious words are just a cover-up for grammar. So, Judy, the sooner we get on with our conspiracy, the sooner we get rid of grammar. It would be a lovely world without subjects and predicates and split infinitives and the conjugation of verbs. But, Judy, grammar isn't just a bunch of rules. I know. It's the building blocks of language. No, it's more like the architect's plan for the building. Well, if you'll pardon me, Professor, I've got some plans for that plan. Then grammar is the plan of how we talk. It sounds important, but rather hard to understand. Judy, it's simply this. The way words are arranged into sentences is as important to meaning as the separate words themselves. Judy, did you know that your brain was unconsciously using grammar long before you started the school? You mean my head's been full of subjects and predicates? And I didn't even know it. <laughs> yes, of course. Have you ever tried to make your mind completely blank? You can't. If your mind goes on talking to itself and in language. That's what we call thinking. For language puts not only words into our mouths, but into our heads, too. Well, that's another trouble with words. Maybe the Hatter is right. Oh, but Judy, before you go, let me say that words themselves aren't to blame. They were developed through the ages to express the vital experiences of people everywhere. In a sense, people live in different worlds, worlds reflected in their languages. If we could understand these many languages, we might hear the people say, we Eskimo must live with snow. It shapes our lives. We have a dozen special words to tell about snow. It's far too important to be dismissed with one word. To us, living in the Trobrian Islands, our very existence depends on raising our crop. We have more than 100 names for yams. Arabic gives us more than 6,000 different words for camel, its parts and equipment. When language expresses our various ways of life, it is indeed our servant. Some scholars have wondered if language is not, at times, our master. People use words. Do words use people? In most of the Oriental world, our various social classes speak one to the other in traditional ways. Does our language then determine our behavior, dictating for each person the way in which he acts towards his equals, his inferiors, his superiors? Our Hopi language has no grammatical way to express past, present, or future. So far as our language is concerned, one might conclude that the world is without time altogether. Scientists, too, are pondering such questions. Does our language shape our whole philosophy of life? 
Is it true that some ideas that are clear in one language may be very difficult to say, may be even difficult to think in another language? Even so-called primitive peoples have developed languages that admirably express their cultures, their ways of life. But scientists have discovered that there are no primitive languages on the face of the earth. These languages used with ease by the crudest savages are just as complex as other tongues. In fact, it sometimes requires the lifetime study of our greatest scholars to figure them out. Anthropologists like Franz Boas, who pioneered in American Indian languages, sought to discover in each language its own system. Following Boas, Leonard Bloomfield began collecting materials on American Indian languages. By this and other work, he set the stage for modern descriptive linguistics. Others, such as Edward Sapir, an expert on many Indian tongues, studied languages as related to cultures and total ways of life. Of all the languages now being spoken, only a few have been studied scientifically. And today, linguistic scientists all over the world are concentrating upon small speech communities that are rapidly dying out to prevent their languages from being forever lost to the study of man. As we understand each new language, we learn more about the way human beings communicate with one another. Oh, look! There's an envelope. Maybe there's a letter inside. It's an invitation. Mad Hatter has been invited to a mad tea party. He's going to prove that language is madness. And the guest of honor is to be Dr. Linguistics. A fish, whiffle, gyre, and gimbal. It'll be right over. My goodness. Tea and linguistics. What a curious combination. The mad tea party is about to commence. Who's coming? Well, I've invited a cowboy from the Southwest, a theatrical publicity man, and, and some other guests. How do you do, Shorty? Get me, ma'am. Uh, Judy, this is Shorty Rogers, famous jazz trumpeter and composer. Hey there, Judy. How do you do? Crazy. Shorty, you're going to meet a very distinguished professor of linguistics. Is this cat cool, square, or way out? Well, I'm not sure that I follow you, but this should prove a very amusing encounter. <laughs> they won't understand each other at all. Shorty, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you the very distinguished Dr. Linguistic. Doctor, this is Shorty Rogers. I'm very happy to make your acquaintance, Doctor. Skin me, man. Man, you're really with it. What's the bit here? Well, a hat here's been trying to bug me on this ABC jazz. Crazy you made the scene, man, crazy. Hey, you're a real live aspirin. Well, I have to split now. So long. Keep cool. They seem to understand each other, but I couldn't. Mimsy, too. Me, either. Well, wait till he meets my next guest. Oh, Dr. L, I'd like you to meet a theatrical publicity man. How do you do? Hi. Looks as if you already have a story. Yep, here's my lead. Tongues wag as wags gag, but hot hat cools as Doc clicks on rhetoric tricks. Well, that just about ball points the hats, chat. Like a fat bat. Well, I gotta run now, Doc. This bash is a bop. Some sock yaks packed in that flax cracks. Flax cracks bandersnatch to me. You're right, they do understand each other. Perhaps this next guest will confuse him. Enjoying yourself? Well, now, I don't want to sound like I was raised on sour milk, but I just can't drink enough of this yellow gargle to get a talking low. You see, these doings give me buck fever. I get my spurs all tangled, and I'm just plain old hogtied when it comes to making chin music with a pack of strangers. Well, Dr. Linguistics? <laughs> well, it was all quite simple. He said he wasn't mouthy, he's fresh out of tongue oil, this wingding shortens his steak rope, makes him feel like he's got his leg tied up. 
Say, partner, you savvy my lingo. You'll do to ride the river with. Well, I gotta roll my wheels. So long, Doc. So long, amigo. Him and me's made of the same leather. Well, so much for linguistics. Now, do let us have some tea. Judy, after that variety of verbal vocalizing, uh, surely you would agree that language is a mixed-up mess. But Dr. Linguistics didn't seem to think the tea party was so mad. No, actually, I thought it was quite sensible. Sensible? With everyone speaking a different language? Different dialect, if you please. Now, these dialects and occupational vocabularies are what make any language interesting, colorful. They're part of our humor, but they're also the subject of scholarly research. Well, Dr. Linguistics, I'm afraid that you and I are not made of the same leather. Well, thanks for the tea and linguistics. It was very pleasant. Judy, would you care to join me in a little research project in American dialect geography? The way a man talks tells us where he comes from. Like in Brooklyn. Some people call a bird a boyd. Yes, it's not only what people say, it's the way they say it that gives us clues to where they were brought up. Clues? That sounds like a mystery. It is, rather. You could look at it as a kind of detective story. First, we'll need a suspect. And a private eye. Let's make it two. For the last time, are you going to tell us where you're from? Oh, you won't, eh? Well, we have ways of finding out. Read this. Mary, Mary, Mary. Aha! Uh -huh. West of the Alleghenies, they pronounce the words alike. He pronounced them all differently. Yeah, that's right. Clue number one puts him east of the Alleghenies. All right, now, read this. Uh, agree? Uh, oh, <laughs> eh, sorry. <clears throat> greasy. Hear that? He said greasy, not greasy. That puts him north of Philadelphia. Ha! Read this. Park. He said park, not park. Yeah, yeah, I heard it. That eliminates coastal New England. Read. Wash water. Hear that? Not wash and water, but wash and water. The rest of New England is out. Must be Central Atlantic State somewhere. Father. Father? That cinches it. I'll put him within a 30-mile radius of Times Square. Right? Yeah. <laughs> 30, 30, and 30. An amusing parlor game, Dr. Linguistics. Something like 20 questions. <laughs> well, a dialect geographer using a list of only 30 words and usually place a person within 20 miles of his home locality so long as he lives in the eastern part of the United States. Dialect geographers began charting their monumental linguistic atlas in the East in 1929 and have been painstakingly working their way to the West. Dr. Hans Kuroth of the University of Michigan has conducted a good part of this research. He and his dialect experts have been traveling around the country for the past 25 years, asking people what words they use for all sorts of things. And they've recorded dialect differences in words and how they're pronounced. Perhaps Dr. Kurath will show us how the atlas is put together. Well, you see, uh, the atlas contains hundreds of maps showing speech differences and their geographical boundaries, which we call isoglosses. May I show you a few examples? This isogloss sets off the area in which griddle cakes are called fritters. This here, around Philadelphia, shows the area where they call them hot cakes. Over here, they're called flannel cakes. To the south of it, batter cakes. 
It is on the basis of isoglosses like these that we establish the dialect bond. Thank you, Dr. Kurath. Man takes his speech ways with him wherever he goes. As the dialects flowed westward the way our population did, the strands unraveled and began to overlap. And here's how they traveled. Western New England accents, coast speech, southern mountain accents, plantation speech, Texas accents. But down east talk in the state of Maine has stayed put. This research has revealed the paths people have taken when they migrated from one part of the country to another and shown the changes going on in American speech patterns. This research has unearthed hitherto unrecorded dialects. It has also marked off areas where big cities have influenced the speechways of neighboring localities. This atlas is a most impressive achievement in one branch of the science of linguistics. Uh, Dr. L. It may be linguistics, it may be impressive, it may even be an achievement in one branch, but don't try to convince me that it's a science. A science is test tubes, telescopes, microscopes, and chromium-plated machines. <laughs> well, actually, linguistics has its own share of hardware. Hardware? Yes, that's what scientists call their machines. But before you can build a piece of hardware, you have to know exactly what you want it to do. And that calls for research and imagination. Will you please? kind of imagination that led to Bell's telephone, to Edison's phonograph, to Marconi's wireless, and to the first all-talking picture. Didn't movies always talk? No, Judy. When I was your age, films were silent. How do movies talk? Well, running along the side of our film is the soundtrack. I wonder whatever it looks like. Well, we might ask the soundtrack to move in a bit. Is that what makes the picture talk? It's just a routine matter of technology. Routine matter of technology, indeed. You surely wouldn't make light of the magic of physics, converting sound into electrical impulses. Why, electronic machines are nothing short of miraculous. You'll see. Example. The sound spectrograph turns speech into pictures. First, the scientist speaks into the machine. Never kill a snake with your bare hands. It is impressive. But what is it doing? The machine separates all sounds into two things, pitch and loudness. The phrase, never kill a snake with your bare hands, comes out looking like this. Is it a new kind of alphabet? Looks more like a fuzzy kind of shorthand. These patterns of light show pitch and loudness in each instant of sound. That gave the scientist an idea. Why not just create speech artificially by painting these patterns on clear plastic with a brush? And when they feed this hand-painted speech into the playback machine, here's how it sounds. Never kill a snake with your bare hands talks by hand. Yes, the sound spectrograph allows linguistic scientists to make very rapid studies of speech sounds. And among other things, some deaf people have been taught to see speech. For example, they learn to recognize this pattern as five. They hear with their eyes. Precisely. They see pictures of speech. Oh, we've got machines that talk to man, and even machines that can listen. Audrey. That's a machine that listens to spoken numbers like a telephone operator and obeys orders. Four. Four. Yes, Audrey, the automatic digit recognizer, can identify numbers spoken into a telephone. And how about the voice typewriter? It takes dictation and types words as they are spoken. C. U. Read it. It's like a secretary who never makes a mistake. No, they're easily confused by different voices and different accents. Voice typewriters are still pretty crude. What about machines that talk to each other? 
Yes, electronic computing machines can transmit data to each other over ordinary telephone circuits. Those machines will soon learn that it's a lot easier to get into this talking business than it is to get out of it. Out of it. Bandersnatch. I never dreamed machines could be so smart. I'd love to have a tea party conversation with a machine. Well, I'm afraid you find the conversation rather dull. You see, Judy, machines have no minds of their own. I thought they had electronic brains. It's the brain of man that tells them what to do. I give up you and your scientific attitude. Magic is just matter of fact to you. Every miracle has to have its qualifications, reservations, footnotes. Uh, goodbye. I hope the soundtrack didn't go away mad. Soundtrack's an impetuous fellow. He was in such a hurry, he neglected to even mention an automatic translator. You see, Judy, for a long time now, scientists have been working toward the realization of machines that will translate one language into another. Here's a machine that's helping them. It's called the Johnniac. Machine translation will need a dictionary and a grammar book, a plan of the language designed for the machines to use. There's still a lot to be done, though. One of the linguistic scientists working on the problem is Professor Kenneth Harper. His students from the University of California at Los Angeles are also helping. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a machine that could translate languages so that everybody could understand everybody else? Yes, Judy, it would. Unfortunately, translating words from one language to another is not the same as understanding that language. But if we knew what the words meant... Well, word-for-word -word translation can never quite communicate to us the thinking, the overtones that convey true meaning in any language. A linguistic scientist, by finding new ways of teaching other languages and making them easier to learn are helping us to break down old barriers. Judy, differences in language have been one of the greatest barriers to a meeting of minds among men. One expression of the desire for greater understanding is the United Nations. As Tertullian of Carthage in 200 AD wrote, Man is the one name belonging to every nation on earth. There is one soul and many tongues, one spirit and many sounds. Every country has its own speech, but the subjects of speech are common to all. Yes, the subjects of speech, day-to-day -day talk, the chatter of small talk, the exchange of pleasantries, news, Gossip, conversation among friends, and with strangers who speak different languages but find ways of understanding each other. Language and speech, the basis for communication, tools for learning, for broadening horizons of the mind, for developing new ideas, for exchanging knowledge. Exploring new frontiers of science. The gift of speech. A universal quality that links each man to the world of men. Language, the pattern of speech, may one day be the instrument that will bring compatibility and understanding to human beings everywhere. I shall be immortalized as the man who freed people from words. But you're already immortal. Huh? Even if your alphabet conspiracy succeeds and you destroy the books, you, Mad Hatter, and you too, Jabberwock, will always live on in the minds of men. It's because they were created out of words. Yet you're both very alive to me. Well, I'm very alive to myself. And so are you, Jabber. I'm beginning to feel it. Immortality. Come on, Jabba. I believe Alice is expecting us.
Word? Word. Hello there, Judy. Having trouble with your homework? You see, there's so much I don't understand, and I'd like to understand. Perhaps I can help. Just as men of science explore the atom, the gene, the universe, so also do they study the living breath of human speech, expressing the needs, affections, joys, hopes, tragedy, the affirmation of faith, the very spirit of man's deepest nature. The Bell System is grateful to the many distinguished scientists who helped to prepare this story of language. Our thanks to the special advisors who supplied and checked the scientific material for this program. Our thanks also to the advisory board, which reviews the scientific aspects of these programs. Its members represent the broad range of modern science, including biology and genetics, medicine, bacteriology and botany, chemistry, geophysics, physics, anthropology, electronics and acoustics, mathematics, engineering. To all these men and to many institutions, the Bell System is indebted for the support they have given this venture in education through entertainment. Thank you.